the soul. Therein shall all manner of people, men, women, young, old. In 1540, the people of England were treated to a novel spectacle. Priests, laymen, lords, ladies. More than a century had passed since Wycliffe's corpse was dug up and burnt in Lutterworth. Virgins, wives, widows, lawyers, and all manner of persons of whatsoever condition and estate they be. And it was only a few years since Tyndale had died at the stake. So therein find all they ought to believe in. But now, an Archbishop of Canterbury, no less, was recommending that the people of England read the Bible in their own language, just as Wycliffe and Tyndale had wanted. The Archbishop's name was Thomas Cranmer, and it was a position he'd held since 1532. It was he, of course, who authorised King Henry VIII's divorce, and he'd been a close political ally of Queen Anne Boleyn. He's largely remembered today for having written most of the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, a wonderful legacy in itself. But he was also a quintessential politician constantly in touch with reformers overseas, and it was he who set the tone for the English Reformation. A Reformation which wasn't simply the whim of an autocratic monarch, but a huge political undertaking. All over England you can see the wreckage of the medieval Catholic Church, the ruins of the monasteries closed by Henry VIII after his break with Rome. They're an enduring symbol of the revolution which hit England in the 1530s after Henry's wholesale takeover of the church. Some of the monasteries were more than 900 years old and their wealth, including perhaps a third of all the land in England, came to the crown. In charge of all this was Thomas Cranmer. He was working hand in hand with Thomas Cromwell, the very man who had sent Vaughan to persuade Tyndale to return, and who was now chief minister. It's as if Cromwell was there to do the dirty work, the political work, the wheeler dealing, while Cranmer did the thinking, did the, the changing in the church. The other great ally for Cranmer for a while was his first great patroness, the second queen, Anne Boleyn. Without Anne, Cranmer's career would not have taken off. But it has to be said that when she fell, Cranmer did slide away from her. There was a greater cause, and that was the Reformation. Of course, Henry VIII relished the money the Cranmer Cromwell Reformation brought him. For one thing, it allowed him to build fortresses like this one to protect the coast. But there were many people who objected. At court, they cheered when Henry had the Protestant Queen Anne executed for treason in 1536. The reformist faction that had gathered around her lost power. But then the forces of conservatism went too far. By the end of the year, they were in open and violent rebellion. They were enraged at the rapidity with which their church was changing before their eyes, and even more than this, at the destruction of the monasteries. The revolt began in the north of England, and it scared King Henry Witless but it also entrenched Cranmer and Cromwell in power. And so the reform of the church continued. There would be no backing down. Bible scripture in the mother tongue was the foundation of Protestant Reformation all across Europe. But it was still not officially available to people in England. Cranmer and Cromwell were in a great hurry. Within months of the rebellion, they'd persuaded King Henry to license the publication of this. It's called the Matthew Bible. It was printed in Antwerp and is supposedly the work of Thomas Matthew. Set forth with the king's most gracious license. But in fact, it was probably put together in exile by an Antwerp friend of Tyndale's. And much of the text is indeed Tyndale's. But it wouldn't have done to say so, so it's identified by these ornate initials, W.T. To those in the know, and there would have been a good many of them, it was a guarantee that this was the good stuff, the real thing. 
Shortly afterwards, Cranmer licensed another version by another exile, and then, after two years' heavy labour, Thomas Cromwell found the money to produce this. This is the Great Bible. In reading through it, you'll find it's pretty much as Tyndale had it. But from 1540, it carried an introduction from Archbishop Cranmer himself, which is as close to an official seal of approval as you're likely to get. It's also why it was sometimes known as Cranmer's Bible. Crucially, unlike Tyndale's translation, this was legal. It wasn't really licensed by the bishops. It was put physically into England's churches on royal command. And the effect was extraordinary. It is convenient and good for the scriptures to be read of all sorts and kinds of people and in the vulgar tongue. In many ways you could see the Reformation in England as just part of the great European story. But there's one big difference in England and that's the shock, the excitement, the exhilaration of gaining the Bible in English. That's what made England different. It meant that the Bible became much more central than I think it was in many Protestant cultures where preaching, hymns, might have said as much about Protestantism as the unfettered act of reading the Bible. Parish records up and down the land record the purchase of these Bibles. Even after Thomas Cromwell had fallen from power, royal orders made sure, thanks to Cranmer, that every parish in the land was forced to buy one. For many, hearing the word of God in English at last was more than a revelation. It was a revolution. Reading the Bible could be a political act, particularly in the early days. Very often, this was turned into an act of defiance against the old church. A mass would be going on at the other end of the church, up at the high altar, and people would stand shouting out the words of the Bible. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What really is going on in that is that essential Reformation declaration that you and I, individuals, stand in front of God. We don't need clergy, we don't need priests. That's in itself a hugely political statement and it lies at the heart of much of English Protestantism in the centuries after. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Eventually every parish in the land had an English Bible. As a result of Cranmer's actions everything Tyndale had hoped for had come to pass. But now the Bible had been translated into English, it was available to everybody who could read. Quite the most awful common people had the holy book in their paws, to do with what they will. And this was, for Henry, a serious problem, both aesthetically and indeed politically. Within just a few months, Henry was having second thoughts about his archbishop's venture. A partial ban was reimposed. By now, everybody was reading the Bible, which was not what the church, nor indeed the government, had intended, certainly not for your lower classes. And so they had access to the Bible withdrawn, a move which was somewhat unpopular. Evidence of the sort of personal disquiet it caused can be found in this rather wonderful old book. Remarkably enough, it was once owned by a shepherd who tended his flock in this very place on top of St. Bree Hill, overlooking the Vale of Evesham. And he bought the book in order to have something to read as he went about his lonely work, because, of course, King Henry VIII had taken his Bible away from him. As he explains, I bought this book when the testament was abrogated, that shepherds might not read it. I pray God amend that blindness, written by Robert Williams, Keeping Sheep upon St. Bree Hill, 1546. By the time Henry VIII died in 1547, the question of England's religious future was still unresolved. Would the country be Roman Catholic, Catholic and not that Roman, or tending towards Protestantism? And now that the Bible had been translated into English, the debate hardened. 
and both Catholics and Protestants held the scripture aloft to justify their sense of rectitude. You may be unsurprised to learn that each side treated the other to a total and utter lack of tolerance, and mutual vindictiveness, cruelty and loathing. Because what happened next was nothing less than a cultural revolution. The new king was Henry's nine-year-old son, Edward, who despite the old king's religious conservatism, had been brought up firmly in the Protestant camp. Cranmer was the new king's godfather. For him and the reformers, this was a great opportunity. The boy and his godfather marched hand in hand in this revolution. It became something really destructive of the old world, something bringing in the new. This is really ruthless, rapid change. Such was the devotion of the reformers to the unvarnished scripture, the word of God, that they attacked all the artistic imagery which had sustained the old church. For them, it was an abomination. For traditional English Catholics, this was sacrilege. Well, there was massive destruction of beautiful, irreplaceable and holy things. The stained glass windows, statues, books, organs and music, precious plate and wonderful vestments. Thousands of bells smashed and so on and so forth. It was an appalling uh, cultural disaster in many respects, rather like uh, what happened in China under Mao and, uh, or the French Revolution in France. Mass destruction, vandalism. I think there was nothing inevitable about the English Reformation. It would not have happened, and certainly would not have happened in the way it did happen, if it hadn't been essentially a state-driven um, event. This is a, a, a hypothetical question. Would you have preferred it not to have happened? Uh, I would, yes. Unequivocally? Yes. As Cranmer's Reformation rolled on, the English Bible became the heart of the English Church. In six short years, it is estimated that 80,000 Bibles were printed in England. And King Edward's cultural revolution had its effect on English nationalism too. In the middle of the 16th century, particularly in the reign of King Edward, you begin to get this sense of the English vocation, um, bound up with the English Bible, the English prayer book, the Church of England, a very ambiguous thing, a very... Um, two-edged sword as the centuries unfold, but that's, I think, where its roots lie. And then came the backlash. After only six years on the throne, Edward VI died. He was succeeded by his elder sister, Mary, and she was a fervent and conservative Catholic. Her counter-reformation was led by Cardinal Reginald Pole. He launched a campaign against the reformers which saw 300 people burnt. Cranmer, who had led the revolution under King Edward, was arrested. He was handed over to the Thought Police, to a panel of Catholic intellectuals for re-education. He was to be forced to recant, to accept that the views he'd held were false. Only that way, they felt, could reform be utterly defeated. It's a scene which has been played out countless times across the centuries, in hostage cells, in the secret police headquarters of totalitarian states. Officially sanctioned bullying on a matter of conscience. For Thomas Cranmer, it was to last for two years. These were very special Catholics. Among them were some of the best theological minds in Europe, Spanish Dominicans, brought over specially, self-confident, sophisticated. These were not the sort of Catholics he'd met in his previous years, where the church, of the old church, was on the defensive all the time. No, now, to his horror, he was meeting Catholics who were part of a new Catholic world. It must have been a terrible psychological shock. pushed on, chiseling at the foundations of Cranmer's belief. If God wanted reformation, why was Queen Mary on the throne? And what about his duty to the Queen? All around him, everyone was telling him to recant. It's a really poignant end 
because this very old man, isolated, undergoing what I guess we would now regard as a form of brainwashing, certainly a kind of mental torture. He has no one to confirm that his, you know, his theology is right. He's daily being visited, argued with, by very sophisticated Catholic apologists. It's not entirely surprising that he, he gives way under that. This is the biggest catch that the old church had from any Protestant leader. And now they had him in their grasp. They had a speech prepared for him, which he'd written out himself, which was in print, and that was the speech which he would give from the pulpit in the university church in Oxford. Now I come to the great thing that so troubleth my conscience, and that is the setting abroad of writing contrary to the truth, which now, here, I renounce and refuse as being things written by my hand contrary to the truth I thought in my heart. And that is, all such bills and papers that I have written and signed with my hand. Since my degradation, wherein I have written many things untrue. But at the end, Cranmer cheated them by changing the very last paragraph. And for as much as my hand hath offended in writing things contrary to my heart, therefore shall my hand be first punished, for when I come to the fire, it shall be first burned. him as Christ's enemy and the Antichrist with all his false doctrine. Now that really brought him back uh, to the centre of triumphant Protestantism. And it meant that he could never be a prize for the old church. Cranmer is an icon, I think, not of absolutely unqualified heroism, but of a sort of honesty that finally breaks through weakness at the very last moment. That's the symbol of the Protestant Reformation in England. That's at the heart of it, really for two, three centuries after 1556. Cranmer's death called a temporary halt to Reformation in England. But nonetheless, the English Bible survived. And it would continue its revolutionary career down the centuries, right to our own time. People get saved by believing that gospel and by no other means. That's it. Join that band of believers who can become the solution and can turn America upside down again. The story of the English Bible is as important today as it was in Tudor times. Particularly in America. There the Bible is still at the center of national politics. And at times of national mourning, the, the president turns naturally to the cadences of Tudor England. As we've been assured, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, can separate us from God's love. God bless America. The Christian right, with its absolutist and literal reading of the Bible, is a potent lobby in America, and its votes helped propel George Bush to power. This movement was spearheaded by preachers like Jerry Falwell.
Southern Baptist Church. We're going to be talking about national repentance. Our nation is in trouble. For Falwell and all of them, it's the Bible that underpins their views. People get saved by believing that gospel and by no other means. That's it. Falwell's church is just one of more than 125,000 English-speaking Protestant churches in America. Not all of them agree with his politics, but they all derive from the same Bible. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit... And it's not an American Bible, it's the English Bible, the authorized version, the King James Bible. Probably the most widely read book in the world, written just decades after the death at the stake of Thomas Cranmer. And seen through Tudor eyes, the truly astonishing thing is that although American churches vary enormously and believe in very different things, there's no bloodshed. A very long way indeed from the chaos of 16th century England. In England, Queen Mary's persecutions had led to more than 300 deaths. But now, in 1558, there was another huge swing of the religious pendulum. Mary was succeeded on the throne by her sister, Elizabeth, Anne Boleyn's daughter. Elizabeth was a convinced Protestant, but she had managed to stay alive during Mary's reign by appearing to conform. Once she was queen, the Church of England was similar. Although its structure with a hierarchy of bishops was traditional, its doctrine was thoroughly reformed. It was a calculated compromise, and Elizabeth is famous for her desire not to make windows into men's hearts and secret thoughts. Elizabeth was a very cool Protestant. She'd lived through the absolutely miserable experience of keeping her mouth shut about being a Protestant in the reign of her sister Mary. And that, I think, gave her a sympathy for those who disagreed with her. What she wanted, like all the Tudors, was obedience. And she didn't really care what people thought inside, as long as they obeyed. She clearly didn't want to take the revolution any further. And that meant that anything which survived from the old world in 1552 carried on. Cathedrals carried on. Choral music in cathedrals, pipe organs, all preserved in her church. And Cranmer's liturgy, which is really quite elaborate for a Protestant liturgy, these are some of the things which make Anglicanism different from other Protestantisms. Queen Elizabeth, of course, was assailed on all sides. Abroad, the Pope and the other Catholic powers wanted to get rid of her. And meanwhile, some exiled English Catholics produced an English language version of the Bible just for Catholics. This is it. It's called the Dowie Bible. And if you were caught reading it, you'd get yourself into a bit of hot water. And amidst this new profusion of Bibles, we have this for the Protestants, the Geneva Bible which comes complete with good, strong and rigorous Calvinist commentary in the margins. And both of these Bibles were symbolic objections to the official version, the Bishop's Bible, which is what everyone read in church. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I imagined as a child. But as soon as I was a man, I put away childishness. Now we Throughout Elizabeth's past. reign, Protestant we ideas and the language of the English Bible percolated deep into the hearts of the population, reinforced by the huge popularity of Bible texts set to music. And by the time Elizabeth died in the 17th century, the English Bible had engendered a new freedom of thought and inquiry. The great thing about the Bible is that you read it yourself. It is there for you to read, and people did. Now what that means is that you can make up your own mind on things.
And one of the peculiar, precious features of 17th century England was that people did make up their own minds. That seems to me to be one aspect of Englishness, a sort of individual contrariness, an unwillingness to be bounded by clergy or by figures in authority. For some enthusiasts or Puritans, Elizabeth's compromised church was not enough. They wanted root and branch reform and an end to bishops. When Elizabeth was succeeded by her cousin, King James of Scotland, the Puritans were delighted, for the Scots had already destroyed the power of their bishops. They thought their time had come. King James was more than merely a competent king. He was an extremely shrewd and wily politician, and he believed this issue could be resolved. He dragged the bishops and the Puritans right here to Hampton Court and convened a great conference during which he thought that peace would break out, there would be concord and harmony would spread throughout his kingdom. So you might imagine, bishops took this rather badly. The conference lasted three whole days, and the bishops took every opportunity to portray the Puritans as dangerous radicals, as indeed many of them were. It looked as if the King's Great Conference was going to come to nothing, and the Puritans would go away empty-handed. But then, one of the Puritan divines raised the question of a new translation of the Bible. The leader of the bishops' party, Richard Bancroft, pounced on the idea. So, King James commissioned a new Bible, whose stated aim was to satisfy all parties. It even draws on the Catholic Dowie Bible. But the vast majority of the text which emerged was Tyndale's work. Or ever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. The King James became the standard and has influenced writers of English for four centuries. Right at the start of things, it's sort of hotwired into our national life. Um, and in the process of being hotwired into our national life, it's part of our poetic life as well, because that's where that belongs. Clearly there are poems uh, through the centuries which partake of that, um, either in the sense that they want to borrow its resonances. I think of somebody like Wilfred Owen, as I say, there's a poem like Strange Meeting. It seemed that out of battle I escaped down some profound dull tunnel, long since scooped through granites which titanic wars had groined. Yet also there encumbered sleepers groaned, too fast in thought or death to be bestirred. Then, as I probed them, one sprang up and stared with piteous recognition. The colour of the language throughout the poem has a kind of unnatural density, a sort of purple concentration to it that is clearly biblical in its associations. It's the language of Isaiah. It's an Old Testament language. And Owen, of course, who was a very religious-minded person, knows this. And in the long passages of my life, when I can't find God, I continue reading it, because it's extraordinarily interesting, amusing, strange, bizarre, um, and a great forcing house of other, for other ideas. Astonishingly, the King James Bible turned out to be acceptable to everyone. It had achieved its primary aim. Remember, Wycliffe's desire was that the Word of God should be available to every Englishman in his own language. And here it was. But as to how the Bible should be interpreted, well, the bitterness, the division, the rancour and the violence was to get worse and worse. The English took to war amongst themselves, a civil war between Crown and Parliament, partly over religious practice. Parliament won, led by Oliver Cromwell, a Puritan descendant of Cranmer's political protector. The English civil wars are a set of text swappings between royalists and parliamentarians. You might say that the parliamentarians had the better texts. And King Charles might not have died if Oliver Cromwell did not think that he was the man of blood to be found in the Bible. That's at least how Cromwell could justify to himself this monstrous act of killing the king. 
but putting him on trial for his crimes against the people. And what's at the center of that? That biblical image of the man of blood. But 20 years of bitter conflict resulted only in exhaustion on both sides. When King Charles II was restored to the throne, religious toleration became part of the law of the land. As a result, in England, from now on, the Bible ceased to be a contentious issue. The Bible wars were over. But in other places, the Bible remains at the center of political and social debate, especially in America. Many people who were unhappy with the settlement in England emigrated there. After all, religious freedom was why the Pilgrim Fathers had come to America in the first place. And there were now settlers, not just from England, but from all over Europe, including Protestants who had been persecuted even by other Protestants. At the heart of all this pioneer spirituality was the King James Bible. But each individual community was different, and each followed the Bible in a different way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Unlike in England, with its state church, conformity was simply not possible. Toleration was a necessity, but the Americans went still further. God hath created the mind free, said Thomas Jefferson, and so the First Amendment to the Constitution insists upon a total separation between church and state and guarantees freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The Bible is a greater political force in America than in any other Western democracy. And some Americans base their political principles on the words of a Bible written nearly 400 years ago. The gospel doesn't change. That's it. Join that band of believers who can become the solution and can turn America upside down again and then turn the world upside down again. Whatever happens in America is going to be exported works that way for good or bad. This missionary fervor is a direct descendant of a Protestant zeal of the original Bible revolutionaries. Once again, the Bible is at the center of a cultural battle between traditionalists and modernists. And it's not a simple matter of conservative right and modernist left. It's a matter of how you read the Bible. We understand the Bible to be the authoritative and inerrant Word of God. The Bible is not so much a divine product, but a human product about divine things. There are no two ways of looking at what the Bible says. It's only one way. Some people would say it's authoritarian and it's exactly what God would have us believe. There are others of us who would say, let's look at what it means to me in the context of my life and my faith in God. Today we take for granted the right to disagree about something as vitally important as how the Bible is interpreted. Disagreement like this is fundamental to democracy. Thank you. 
ونوعدك الفتوح مجددا يوما ندوس به على صلبانكم نصرا وبشراكم جهنم موعدا أقسمت إلا قيتنا لوجدتنا سيفا يمانيا عليك مسددا وعدا علينا أن ندوك حصونكم والوعد دين للفتاء أوعدا والوعد دين part and parcel of freedoms we have all come to expect freedoms whose first shoots sprang up in English soil more than 600 years ago and were nourished by the courage and the blood of the Bible revolutionaries. Wycliffe, Tyndale and Cranmer believed that the word of God must reach the people directly otherwise they couldn't be saved and that's why translation was for them the crucial issue. They assumed a little easily that the common people would interpret the Bible much as they'd done. This however was not always the case because now everyone could make of the Bible what they wanted. The holy text was at last ours. And no longer would we have to take any notice of priests, pastors, bishops or popes. And that, for me, is the greatest legacy of the English Bible. Freedom of choice, freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. You can find out more at Channel 4's Faith and Belief website, channel4.com slash believe.